I was dealing with the London Ambulance Service, really, just as a sort mm -hmm. of case, but as it turns out, this seems to be true nationwide as well. Um, and the crisis in the London Ambulance Service can't really be exaggerated. I mean, they predict they're going to be 600 paramedics down by the end of the year. That's a third of all the paramedics they've got. So Because they're, they're resigning, they're quitting, they're resigning, they? They're quitting, and so I was asking, as you say, why? And um, in the first piece, I asked a question, and for the following two weeks, I was inundated with emails and calls, and I went to meet several paramedics who mm -hmm. talked to me, you know, under conditions of sort of secrecy, and they said, I've got here some of the things they said, um, the real problem isn't pay, um, it isn't really overwork, it's bullying in, um, within their management system. They say, for instance, um, there's a pervasive sense that management are out to get you people, paramedics are afraid to speak out because of the repercussions. Um, they say it's all about conditions at work, bullying management, lack of equipment. One here says I left the London Ambulance Service four months ago um, and my boss, my new boss says I behave like someone who's been in an abusive relationship. There's even talk of the service having a suicide watch list because paramedics are so unhappy. Now I'm not Su sure that's... Suicide watch list? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if that's true, but it's mm. at least interesting because that's what paramedics are saying. Um, that management are aware of how unhappy these paramedics are and so they have a watch list for people who might be committing mm. suicide. And they're leaving in droves. Mm. Whether they're suicidal or not, they're certainly leaving. And that leaves all of us mm. high and dry. So, so Julia, um, the government had pledged to keep the health spending budget protected. This was supposed to be the theme of the four years here. They might cut um, police, that they might cut even education, but the health service would stay intact. Something appears to be going wrong, doesn't it, here? You're right, Fraser. And just to pick up on what Mary was just saying, unfortunately, what we're hearing in this story are the familiar themes yeah. of bullying and uh, you know, the, the culture in the NHS uh, being one where people are leaving yeah. uh, rather than actually saying, no, this is going wrong and, and whistleblowing yeah. uh, because they're worried about their, uh, their jobs, they're worried about repercussions. And they want to get other jobs elsewhere, elsewhere in the NHS and they're frightened. That's about right. Management and, and will say, we're yes. striking you off or putting a black mark against you. Absolutely, you won't work elsewhere yeah. if you do that so and this isn't driven by, by cuts or anything but just simple mismanagement well I, I think there are there are um, three areas that we can look at in terms of the source of the problem and, and again three areas for the solution as well so starting with the the professionals themselves I think that uh, we know that hospitals know where the poor performing GPs are, where people yeah. will call an ambulance or turn up at A&E because they can't access their GP. Yeah, and point. if the hospital knows that, you can bet your bottom dollar that the ambulance service knows that as well. So there's an issue around access to medical care yeah. and that um, is, isn't being, people aren't being in particular general practice, they're not being held accountable for that. So that's one problem and that's irrespective of, of funding. But then there is also an issue, and you picked this up in your article, Mary, around the board discussion that happened around what was going on in the London Ambulance that Service. I thought that was really telling. Extraordinary. I mean, we all know that you know everyone complains about their work and these you know, paramedics are unhappy. So you assume, and you know the management knows, so you assume yeah. they're going to take it seriously. I mean, as we discussed, this is a third of the whole service sort of leaving by the end of the year. You know, huge shortfall. And you've been going through the board minutes. You've been going through the board yeah. minutes, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they say, the chief was, executive says things like, um, oh, how are we going to recruit more deaf yeah. paramedics into the service? Yeah. That was item one on the agenda. And yeah. someone, one of the NEDs, the non-executive director, says, um, I'm very concerned about the air quality in London for the yeah. paramedics. No, that's the least of their worries. They're mm. suicidal with stress. I mean, it's... Yes. Really and the yeah. Stuff. So, yeah, so quality and well-being, nowhere to be seen. And you know, in, in theory, politicians are saying that's what boards should be discussing. Yeah. In practice, it's nowhere on any but agenda. Why, why because, that? Well, that, that comes to the, the, the second group of people, and this comes back to your point, Fraser, about politicians and also funding. I think... Politicians have, despite Andrew Lansley's attempts to remove politicians from the NHS, you know, that hasn't happened and sadly it's never going to happen. And management, chief execs constantly looking over their shoulders to see whether they're being checked, whether they're meeting targets, whether they are doing things as they should do. I mean, one sad but accurate fact is that the average lifespan of a chief executive in an NHS uh, foundation yeah. trust is 18 months. Right. That's, that's how long they last before they quit and move on, so either out of the right service. To the top. Absolutely. And 
and so there, there's a there's a culture of fear which comes top down yeah. from the politicians, you know, I focusing see, on targets, focusing on waiting times. That that is that is what happens on the ground, even though the rhetoric is about quality and well-being and, and safety of patients. People should be asking, you know, a lot of the time whether the targets are the right targets. I mean, it could be oh, that yes. you're responding to, you know, a chest pain in eight minutes, but how many of those people reporting chest pains did actually uh, go on to have a heart attack? Were they heart attack patients? Actually, not very many of them were. So yeah, I mean, who's re-evaluating th- these targets everyone's so frightened about not hitting? Yeah. Yeah. Julia, yeah. it's difficult, though. I mean, if you've got a system where the government has got exclusive control, as it does in the NHS, if you don't have targets, it's hard to get quality assurance otherwise, isn't it? I mean, aren't targets just inevitable if you're going to have the NHS run as one massive bureaucracy? I think some targets are, and, and that comes back to the point that Mary just made. Uh, you know, some targets are important, but others are just ludicrous. So why is there a one fixed target for everyone in A&E of four hours? No, if you turn up and if you're an uh, emergency yes, trauma patient, no, you should be seen immediately, no matter where you are in the queue. If you're someone who has come along you know, for a bandage to be re-put on your leg, well, really, you should be left to, to you know, to, to sit there for as long as it takes for you to go off and find someone else to do it because but it's pathetic a, use of the services. But there is a triage system, isn't there? When you go into A and E, you see somebody pretty quickly, and don't they more or less assess? whether you can wait or whether you can't. Well, you're registered, but that's to make sure that you don't breach the four-hour waiting target. So, you know, the actual reason for registering you is not to you know, ensure that the most needy are seen first. It's yeah. to make sure that no one breaches that target. Also, so yeah. some targets are, are essential, and, and, and it's part of good management to have, you know, uh, and, uh, key performance indicators. But there are far too many targets which actually lead to, to the culture that we currently have, which is one of fear and bullying, because if we're not going to meet this target, we're going to get criticised, so-and-so might lose their job. And the focus, again, is not on quality and safety. You know, it's on those targets. So it, we need an intelligent approach to targets. And I just wanted to answer your question about funding. The mm. NHS fund and NHS budget has been ring-fenced. And the, that, that is, uh, that's as it is. But what politicians have refused to engage in is a discussion about what that money is spent on. And they've gone on pretending that we can carry on funding everything that we're currently doing, yeah. that the, the creep that we've seen in the NHS and the services that are provided over the past 65 years is something that we don't actually have to have a public conversation about because there is a limited capacity. There are pressures, both cost pressures through new technologies, which are fantastic, but to say that we can give the best to everyone is you know, completely yeah. disingenuous. It's it's a false you know, falsehood. So politicians need to step up to the plate and have, you know, be bold enough to have a conversation with the public about yeah. what do we want the NHS to be there for? What are the priorities? You mean whether we should fund sex change operations and things like that. Oh, that could be one of the conversations to be had. Yes, and and you know, what what we what do we want it to be in the 21st century? We all want it to stay. We want it to remain free at the point of use. But what you know what should not actually be included in yeah. that core service because we can't do everything. So what would, does it really need to be that there takes for? Some guts and it takes actually caring about patients, not about sort of spin and presentation. Yes, I, you know, it really needs you know, uh, some grown-up cross-party discussions to happen. It, you know, if, if politicians are serious about wanting to protect the NHS, wanting it to be there for the future, wanting it to be there for our children and grandchildren, then they owe us to have this grown-up discussion in public. Mary, Mary, for fund, for, yeah. and for funding is, of course, all one aspect, but you... But good management costs the same as bad management. And a lot of what you describe here is just simply behaving, people behaving badly. And you say there is a, a former chief executive of London Ambulances, Peter Bradley, yeah. who actually got it right. Yeah, I mean, it could be the case that he was dealing with fewer calls. Even in 2012, there were fewer calls to 999. However, you know, as I understand it, he gave an hour and a half this time every year to each ambulance station. And because they felt listened to, they were more prepared to do their work. We're all in it together because mm-hmm. they're terrific, you know, heartfelt, vocational people. Um, and as I understand it, the top brass now don't do that same sort of listening and caring. And I'm sure that would go a long way to alleviate the stress that the frontline staff feel in this case. Mm-hmm. Well, you always hear stories in the NHS of the chief execs who do that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, they stand out. Those yeah, who spend time you know, on the wards, in the corridors, yeah. talking to staff, you know, they're the ones who pick up on what the real issues are, sure. you know, can meet those needs and engender goodwill amongst the staff. And if you see, that's in every organisation. It's true in our organisation. It's true in schools, you know, however 
tough the kids, a good head teacher will have the will have sort of the support of his staff and morale yeah. will be transformed by him. Now, we know that um, Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary, is, is a fan of the podcast and listens to it. So we've got a chance here, Julia, to send him a message. What do you think he needs to do to make sure scandals like the one Mary has revealed in this week's magazine happen less frequently? Or what can he do to head it off before? Because I can imagine this will get worse between now and the election. It, it could do. I think a key message is to think about the complexity of the current system we have. We've got 999, we've got urgent care centres, yeah. we've got 111, we've got out of hours, we've got minor injuries, we've got accident emergency, three levels of accident emergency centres. The public don't know where to go. They're completely confused. So we need a coherent, consistent message about when it's appropriate to use services. And that's something that he can do. And I think they also need to request the public that they use services differently because because again, Mary, you picked up in, in your work that uh, I think it was in your first blog piece, the abuse of 999. Sure. Those, and 111. Ab, ab, yeah, both those services. You know, It's free at the point of use. People just use it like calling a cab. And we know that you know, a lot of people abuse alcohol and then they use services inappropriately. Yeah, and the government's thinking of charging them now when they turn up drunk into A&E, isn't it? But the thing is, but you can't really say to people, can you please stop using 999 as much because they are going to anyway, aren't they? You know, in a call centre, you can have a system that effectively dis, dis, you know, discriminates between urgent care and non-urgent care. At the moment, there's a sort of risk-averse tendency. Well, send an ambulance in case mm. they do turn out to be ill. Maybe we have to manage our expectations sometimes, you know. And I think we can learn from some of the other services. West Midlands Fire Service, for instance, a few years ago. In fact, that the law's been there for some time. You can charge, you can fine people for inappropriate use of services. What about that? So, of charge, so West, West Midlands so, Fire Service, a couple of years ago, raised £30,000 through charging people for calling them out because their cat was up a tree or because they were locked out. But, you know, things that maybe needed dealing with but were inappropriate use of Something the service. Like that, and, you know, we're used to paying speeding fines. We're used to stumping up when we've abused the system. We should apply that to the NHS as Brilliant well. Brilliant idea. I hope Jeremy Hunt's listening.